Capricorn is my trail name. Um, for those of you who don't know what a trail name is, those of us in the long distance hiking community, we give each other f uh, names. Sometimes they come about as like a funny joke or something that, ha that, ha that happens on the trail. I wear a unicorn hat, so my name is Unicorn <laughs> on the trail. So that's why this presentation is called A Rainbow Unicorn. So today I'm going to be talking about my hike on the Pacific Crest Trail. What's the Pacific Crest Trail or PCT? It's a 2,650-mile-long trail that uh, spans um, from border to border, from Mexico to Canada, and um, basically goes through the various mountain ranges, through the high Sierras in California, and then up into Oregon and Washington through the Cascade Mountains. And um, 2,650 miles long. So why the PCT? Um, I first heard about the PCT, I don't know, a few years back, maybe 10 years ago, I saw a National Geographic documentary on it and thought, wow, that's cool. I'll never do something like that. I'm mean, like, special, amazing people do something like that. I'll never have the time or the energy or the inclination to do that. And then a few years later, the book Wild came out and I saw the movie and I thought, well, Cheryl Strait can do it, I can do it, <laughs> you know. Um, since the book came out, the trail has gotten pretty popular and we're seeing a lot of overuse issues because of the rise in popularity of the trail since that book came out. And a lot of hikers were inspired by the trail, but it's not cool to admit that. No, no PCT hiker will usually ever admit that to you, even if it's true. So I was like, well, what do I do? I, I didn't know much about hiking. Uh, my mom and uh, dad took me on hikes when I was a little kid, but when I became an adult, I never went on hikes. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't feel comfortable going on a hike, initiating that process myself. So I just was waiting for someone else to take me on a hike. And then one day, in my mid-30s, it sort of occurred to me, you know, I have a library degree, right? Like I could read a book <laughs> or go onto the internets or something. So I started reading, um, these, some of these books up front are books that I uh, consulted as I was preparing for my PCT hike. But in the beginning, I'm reading like Hiking 101 and you're reading about the 10 essentials and like, well, hiking is just walking and you're just walking in the woods and I did this all by myself. I went on a hike in near Seattle and then I went on a little longer hike and then later that summer I went on my first backpacking trip by myself where I went like three miles in, camped and went three miles out and I was really excited. Um, and then after a little bit of that I thought, well, you know, I can do this and I started hiking my, planning my PCT hike um, for 2017. So, preparing for my hike. A uh, hike like this requires a lot of preparation. Um, you don't have to do as much planning as I did. I'm a big planning person. I'm a program manager in, in the default world. So I like planning. It's one of my favorite things. So I started thinking about the PCT. I started talking about it all the time. My partner Daniel can attest to the fact that I pretty much talked about the PC nonstop for like two years. <laughs> he was three. He held up his finger three years. Um, I was pretty focused on it. Um, after I sort of realized, okay, I can hike, I can backpack, and um, I, uh, I picked 2017 as the year and I started reading all these books, I started planning on my resupply strategy, um, learning about gear. Um, I elected to, um, <laughs> these are all the boxes that Daniel mailed to me when I was on the trail. Um, <laughs> you don't need to do it this way. Uh, you can get by with only having a few mail drops on the trail. When you hike the PCT, you're going through towns every five to seven days, more or less. And when you get to town, you can um, resupply there, and oftentimes there'll be a grocery store where you can buy food. But some of these towns, you just have like a gas station, so unless you just want to like eat beef jerky and M&Ms for the next week, which some hikers do, uh, you need to maybe do some more planning. Um, I elected to dehydrate all of my own food. So I quit my job to about two months before I hit the trail. I had two dehydrators going 24 hours a day with recipes I didn't adequately test in advance. <laughs> Some of them were like a little not so delicious. Um, but I did it and I tried and it was pretty fun. So um, Daniel would ship me one of these boxes uh, about on a weekly basis. I had a spreadsheet, all the boxes were numbered, then I'd be like, send box number two to Idlewell at this address, and be like, okay. Okay, it didn't normally go that 
smoothly. There was a lot of confusion. It wasn't until like a three weeks in and Daniel was like, maybe we should number the boxes. When you say the Idlewild box, do you mean the box before? Yeah, anyway, it got complicated. So, yeah. Um, so lots of preparation around meal planning, um, mailing myself supplies, etc. cetera. Um, that's not the only kind of planning that I did for this trip. Uh, you talk to any hiker of any kind and like, the first thing you start talking about is either pooping or gear. So um, you can just spend hours talking about gear. What kind of bag do you have? What kind of sleeping bag do you have? What kind of this do you have? So um, I did lots and lots of research on gear. Uh, one of my favorite hikers, who is the author of this book here, which is Long Trails by Liz Thomas, trail named Snorkel, who I recommend if you ever want to do a long hike. Her, her big piece of advice is, uh, don't buy any gear for your hike until uh, until about six weeks before or six months before you you start your long hike because technology is changing all the time. So um, I, I had I, I did the Wonderland Trail um, about eight months before I hit the PCT and I needed gear for that hike and so I tried some out and I needed to change up some gear. But essentially this is all the gear that I brought on my hike. Um, when you're hiking a long trail like the PCT, or the Appalachian Trail or any other long trail, one of the key things to keep in mind is you want to keep your gear as light as possible. Ultra light. Really critical. So um, you get into the hiking community like um, Facebook groups or bulletin boards and like people are talking about what their, their, their pack weighed and how many ounces is this and, 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 we, get, and we get, you know, yes, I am one of those hikers that, that cut off one end of my toothbrush so I would have saved myself an ounce. I had half of a comb. Um, I did those things. I, so, you know, I, I almost didn't even bring a comb, but, you know, I had this much of a comb. It worked fine. Um, so, the hikers are always talking about their, their pack weight, their base weight, and so that's something that comes up a lot. Um, your base weight is the, the weight of your bag without any consumables, so no water, no fuel, or no, or no food, because that fluctuates as you hike. And so everyone's like, what's your base weight? And we're like, seeing who's the coolest person, who has the lowest base weight. Uh, you know, and it's important to have a low base weight because every, every ounce that you carry is like, you have to, you know, that's, that's over time, you're, those are injuries you could be giving yourself to your knees and strain your in your back that you're carrying. But on the other hand, it's like, well, but do I want to forgo that extra shirt? Or that, you know, you have to, you know, sometimes you need... I eventually ended up with two um, sleeping pads. I'm, I'm in my 40s now. I'm not, I'm not, I'm getting, I need those two sleeping pads, you know? <laughs> also, one of my sleeping pads, I, I, I kept, um, I had this problem where it, it kept uh, malfunctioning and it wouldn't work properly and then I would have zero sleeping pad. So uh, I, I decided to go with two. And the nice thing about this one here, so I have a blow up one. And then halfway through my trip, I started hiking with this one, which also doubles as an excellent sit pad and nap pad. So you get you get to a little short break, and then you put this down, and you like take a little take a little breather, <laughs> and then you get to keep going. So that turned out to be an, um, invaluable for me. Also, as I prepared for my hike, um, I did a lot of other stuff as well. Um, I took an online course uh, uh, with. Uh, Liz, who is the author of this book, she hadn't written this book yet, but she was teaching an online course, which I took, and then I met her at the um, American Long Distance Hiking Association, RUC, which is a group um, with that, uh, other people who are excited about hiking, and at, at their RUC, if you ever are interested in doing a long hike, I recommend going to one of their RUCs, they do a pack shakedown, so you can meet with, and it, um, here I'm meeting with uh, Allgood, who's the president of the association, and he did a pack shakedown where he went through I brought my backpack, I went through everything, he's like, yeah, you, why would you bring us extra stuff sacks? That's like an extra ounce. Get rid of that. Okay. And just like stuff like that where they give you really good advice. Um, stuff that was invaluable to me. Um, I, I, took, I uh, joined the Mountaineers and I took a class on wilderness navigation. I took a class on avalanche safety. I took a class on snowshoeing, which didn't really turn out to be applicable. Um, <laughs> Uh, navigation first aid, anyway. So I, I, did, I did those kinds of trainings as well. And then I went on lots of hikes. Here's a picture of mom and me uh, going on a hike in Mount Baker. Oh, and oh yeah. Yeah, lots, lots of hiking. 
So once all the preparations are ready and I was ready to hit the trail, I had my permit in hand. Oh yes, by the way, uh, you need a permit when you hike the PCT. When you, um, you can get one permit through the Pacific Crest Trail Organization that covers you for the entire trail. And with the, with the permit, they, um, they throttle the number of hikers who start the trail because all the hikers want to start at the same time. 90% of hikers who do the PCT and try to do it in one season, which is what I was trying to do, uh, they all want to start in a month. Uh, they, most of them go northbound, so they start at Mexico and they go to north to Canada, and then they, um, they, they all generally want to start in the month of April because there's a limited window in which you can you do the first 100 mile, 700 miles of desert, and then you get to the high Sierras, and you want the snow to have just melted enough in the Sierras so that you can go through without having to deal with mountaineering like winter snow conditions. And then as soon as you make it through the Sierras, it's a race to get to the Canadian border before it starts snowing up here in the Cascades. So everyone wants to start at the same time. And the problem was you would get like 500 people starting at the same day, and the trail can accommodate that. So with the permitting system, they would space people out. So only 50 people per day and kind of space people out. So permit in hand. Just over a year ago, I flew to San Diego and um, started my hike. I have a good friend in San Diego. Uh, she put me up for the night, and I stayed with her, and then she drove me to the trailhead. Uh, the trail is about an hour's drive east of San Diego, and uh, that's where the trail, the southern terminus is, uh, right near Campo, California. Um, and uh, it's right north of the border wall. Like, there's the board, there's a wall there, a border wall. You can touch the fence. I don't know if it's recommended. Some people did. I, I didn't want to get that close. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, and there it is. There's the southern terminus. And I got to say, when I finally got to the southern terminus border, uh, border, I was so excited. Like, <laughs> this was a big deal. I've been preparing for this for so long. I was like, ah, it's happening. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Woo! I was, I was, uh, I was super, super excited. Uh, the culmination of uh, a big dream. So, here, you know, you sign the register, you get your picture taken, and then you're off. So, now I'm hiking. Uh, my friend, who dropped me off at the terminus, hiked the first five miles with me. She also wants to hike the PCT someday. Then I bid her goodbye, and I kept going. And I'm, I'm heading north, off to Canada. So, my first 20 miles. So, I'm in my first 20 miles. Oh, ouch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the first 20 miles, I'm um, hiking through the desert, and the, bit, the first big milestone is getting to Lake Morena, and there's a picture of Lake Morena there in the uh, lower uh, hand corner there. So the first 20 miles of the PCT are kind of notorious of being kind of like a, a waterless stretch. There's not a lot of water in that section, and a lot of PCT hikers are overly ambitious and not in great shape, not much shade, not a lot of water and a lot of people get into trouble in that section of the PCT. It sort of weeds out some people immediately. Uh, lots, of, lots of rescues in that section. So I was really nervous. I think I had like five liters of water, which is 10 pounds of water, if you're wondering how much that is. I was, oh, you know, I don't want to die of heat exhaustion. <laughs> um, as it turns out, I didn't need to worry um, last year, and I'll be talking about this quite a bit in this presentation, was known as a high snow year, a high water year. So actually what it really was is a normal snow and water year. Typically in California, we have what's, in, the state of California is in a, in a drought. And so the PCT hikers have been getting used to less water, which means less snow on the Sierras to make it through those parts of the trail easier. But it also means less water when you're hiking through the desert and, and it's, um, you're thirstier, you're, you have to ration your water, you gotta be careful, maybe carry more water and pay attention to that. So, um, I, I was really nervous, but since we had such a high water year, um, I had water at mile three, at mile five, at mile seven, I didn't really need to worry about it. Um, so, most, most hikers were like, can you make it to Hauser Creek, which is at mile 15? I made it like 12 miles my first day, I'm like, okay, I'm out. This is really hard. I was so excited, and it took me a while to kind of get my hiking legs to, to get those long miles in. So, in the, in the beginning, you're taking your picture at every single mile marker, like, mile one, woo, mile five, five miles, like, all the, all the major um, mile markers. 
And then of course, the blister, um, lots of blisters on the PCT. Um, hikers who do other long trails, like the Appalachian Trail, will come to the PCT and it's different terrain, it's a lot hotter. Um, I had done enough research to know that uh, you buy a shoe size about a size bigger than you normally would wear because your feet will swell. And so I prepared for that. I had lots of band-aids. I had lots of foot care. And I knew I was going to get blisters. And I, um, about two or three weeks in, I changed my socks to Njinji's, which is like the toe socks. Yeah. So my, my toes would quit rubbing together, and that really helped for me, my blister situation. <laughs> um, but the first month or so, all the hikers tend to have some more than others, but blisters is more of a factor until your feet toughen up. So after that, continued hiking through the desert. Um, another big milestone is when you get to the town of Julian, moms um, will give all the PCT hikers, if you show your permit, free pie. So we're like, yeah, let's go to Julian, let's get our free pie. Once you're out on the trail, like, you're, you're so excited to be there. You're so excited to be there, but then you just start thinking about all the town food that's coming up next. So, um, yeah, pie. But, you know, I, I hiked with an umbrella, which I have on my backpack here. So I, um, so you can see that in that picture, that's actually Easter Sunday of last year where I was taking a little siesta. Um, I, I was able to take my umbrella and stick it onto my backpack so I could have my hands free for my hiking poles. To me, I always use my hiking poles, which are right here, because I think it takes the strain off of my joints. Also, it stops me from tripping and falling. Like, I still can't stop myself from tripping, but the, the, the poles keep me from falling on my face, and that saved me a lot of times. Um, here, uh, let's just say there's many uses for feminine items, and I put them on my feet more than once. Um, I had a lot of blisters. Um, and that's one of the things that you do, is you make do with what you have. So it's not just about how much gear you have with you, it's about how you take what you have and reuse it. You can use to, you know, a lot when the wilderness first aid class I took, you didn't bring that many more first aid type items with you, but you were using duct tape and in your like clothing to, to in, in whatever bit you had to to make do and kind of learning how to do that. Here is a picture of a, a horse trough and it says non potable water for horses only. Of course we drank out of that water, uh, but we have filters. So we filtered it um, uh, so that we would always take pictures of ourselves next to the non potable water signs that we're gonna drink out of because we thought that was really funny. Um, the PCT is is a horse trail. It's graded for horses, and um, so um, I did pass a number of, not a whole lot, but there's a few people who go do the whole thing on horseback, or as much as they can. Um, so, and then down here in the lower uh, corner is uh, Garnet Turtle and Halfway, and I met them within the first week of my hike. Actually, I met Halfway at the Southern Terminus. I didn't meet him, but he took our, my picture. And then I met him about a week later and found out that, like, oh, these people are from Seattle. And then we became friends, and we just did a hike together a few weeks ago, because we're both from, all three of us are from, from Seattle. So you meet people on the trail that become friends for, for the rest of your life, you know? So here, you were in the desert, going through Scissors Crossing, and just, uh, the great thing about it being a high water year is we had a lot more uh, blooms in the desert, so it was just an amazing experience. I don't get to see that many cacti around here, being from the Pacific Northwest, so that was like, oh, another cactus, that's so cool, you know, like, pretty exciting. In the lower corner, I can't remember what this prairie is called, but you, after about 100 miles or so, you, you get to this valley and, you, and there's just ex a whole expanse of this prairie land, and you get to what is called Eagle Rock. So I don't know if you can see it because it's kind of zoomed in or zoomed out, but there's this rock formation that looks like an eagle. And so everyone gets up there and gets their picture taken and it was this gorgeous sunny day and everyone, you get there and we're just sitting around having a little break and enjoying this sort of beautiful sunny afternoon at Eagle Rock. Around this time, uh, we came into Warner Springs I was experiencing a lot of foot pain at this point. Um, I had hip surgery a couple of years ago on my right hip to repair a torn uh, a labral tear, which is a tear in the cartilage. And it kind of, I've recovered from that surgery, but it did throw sort of the mechanics of my right side out sort of out of whack. And I had, um, at this point, a lot of pain in my foot. And I, I was 
I cried all the way into to Warner Springs, and it was pretty difficult. So it's it's not all fun. I mean, these pictures are amazing, but I had some tough times too. And then a friend of mine, who who's not a physical therapist, but he's had enough physical therapy on himself to kind of know how to do it on other people, and he showed me some tricks to um, to work on the muscles of my foot that I use to kind of help. That really helped me with the rest of my hike. I bought one of those little uh, trigger point massage balls. That's for a hiker to bring something like that with the hike on the hike, and you know I'm like, gosh, that's a few ounces. I'm like, do I want to bring that? Like, and I did, and it and I would use that to help loosen up the muscles in my foot. So, and that I, I got better after that, but um, I was taking a lot of ibuprofen there for a while. After Warner Springs, hiking north into Idlewild, just uh, through some more desert sort of arid places. This is a water cache near Mike's place, which is one of the more famous little stops along the way. The lower right hand picture, um, as you approach Idlewild, the trails around Idlewild, in and out, uh, right in, on the PCT right around Idlewild has been closed for a number of years. There was a forest fire there a while back. And when there's a forest fire right on the trail, it can take a number of years of uh, closure before they will reopen it because um, you know, damp trees could fall down and hurt someone, and it, it, it takes a long time. So there's an established detour along these Forest Service roads and these other trails. I uh, did that a number of times. After Idlewild, I hiked out with my friends Halfway and Sunkissed up to Takis Peak, which is on the way back to the PCT, and we decided, which is with a more difficult way out because we wanted to go to this cool lookout on the way back to the PCT. Um, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Um, and then the next ridge over, I took a picture right here, and this is of Takis Peak from the next ridge over. So the, the lookout's like over there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then as, after Takis Peak, on our way to the PCT, there was like a couple mile along this ridge, and we had heard that it was snow covered and it was super steep, and there's us walking along this sort of uh, bank, and then I broke my hiking pole, so there's a picture of my broken hiking pole. 200 miles in, I, I mean, I did have a carbon fiber hiking pole and they're more prone to being broken, but um, I hiked with that broken hiking pole for another 300 miles. Mm -hmm. I just took the tubing from the repair kit from my tent and put it on there and duct tape it, and I'm like, well, it still kind of works, and then <laughs> until I could get to an REI and get a new one. After that, we uh, summited Mount uh, San Jacinto. So Mount San Jacinto is not technically, the summit is not on the PCT, but it's like a two, three mile detour. And that was pretty exciting. It was snow covered and it was my first time. And it's one of those sort of snow covered areas where then there was no established trail when I went up there. It was, okay, you have your GPS and I guess it's up that way somewhere and you're just making your way up. And I'd never done anything like that before. Now that's not that scary to me, but at the time that was pushing my, <laughs> my comfort zone. Um, but we made it to the top. I don't remember the, oh, but it says right there, 10,000. Really? Okay. <laughs> 10,234 feet. Well, that's the tallest elevation I'd ever been at the time. So it was a big deal for me. So um, that was summiting Mount San Jacinto. And then after that, going back down in elevation, down to the valley floor, where I was going down this, all these switchbacks down this hill, and there was a, a sign. Someone had taken some twigs and put H2O on the ground with an arrow, and I saw that, and I'm like, okay, I guess there's over here a spring, and I went over there and filled up my water bottles and went going down the hill. I had my umbrella on. I had my music on. I was like, it's kind of hot out. I didn't realize how hot it was. I was hydrated, so I felt okay. I got to the bottom of the hill, and you can't, kind of hard to see here, but there's a, a little drinking fountain, and everyone's sitting around here. And, that, and then they were like, yeah, it's like 110 degrees out. And people are like suffering from heat exhaustion. Like they had some bunch of people didn't see that spring and didn't, and they were really thirsty. And it was dangerous out. But I was okay because I, I had enough water. But there was a number of times when it was, you get down to the valley floor and it was over 100 degrees and you're just, it can be dangerous. You got to be really careful. Um, one of the things that PCT hikers in the Oregon, and sorry, in the desert area do is it gets to after about 11 a.m. and it gets over 90 degrees or so, you don't tend to hike, it's too hot. In order to hike when it's that hot, you have to carry so much water to keep yourself hydrated that it's not worth it. And so we would typically try to find a place to take a siesta. 
Uh, so you get up early, you do your hike until about noon, or sorry, 11, and then you siesta until the hot part of the day has passed, and then you keep going. So, but sometimes you're like, well, maybe if I just go a few more miles, I can make it to like the watershed preserve. And that's what I did the next day, and like, no, I didn't make it there until 5 p.m. Again, I got about 2 p.m., and I was realizing I wasn't anywhere close. There was no shade anywhere, and I needed to get some shade. So I, like, huddled under my umbrella next to this rock by myself for a couple hours, feeling miserable, like, this is dangerous. Like, and that happened several times, <laughs> but you just keep going. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so this is my hiker trash. Slide number one, I have another one later on. Um, since you do, when you do the PCT at the traditional time, when you go northbound starting in April, you have lots of other people you hike with, and you meet this amazing hiker community. Um, we sometimes look kind of homeless and kind of dirty, kind of trashy, so the term hiker trash is one that we use, you know, fondly to refer to, refer to each other as. Sometimes I think people don't mean it fondly, but we choose to use it as a fond term. <laughs> and we do kind of crazy things, like wash our clothes in a bucket over there. Like when you haven't washed your clothes in a week and someone's like, here, you can use this bucket. You're like, yes, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, that's at Warner Springs. Same place, they also had bucket showers. So they provided like a, a place with the door that closes and then give you a bucket. And you're like, ah, yes, thank you. Um, another thing that happens when you do this kind of hiking is after a few hundred miles, you start developing, developing what's called hiker hunger, where you can eat a lot because you're, you're burning through so many calories. This particular place, I don't remember where it, what it's called, but it's a place where it's in a campground, and like there's a, uh, they deliver pizza there. <laughs> yeah. There's a flyer on the table where this guy delivers pizza, and we're like, how much pizza should we get? And we're like, we're all ordering our own large pizzas. <laughs> I actually couldn't eat that much pizza, and, I, and then I had like leftovers for the next meal, so that was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Another thing that us hiker trash folk do is a lot of uh, hitchhiking. So that's something that we just had to get used to. I had, I've never hitchhiked before because, you know, your mom always tells you you shouldn't hitchhike. <laughs> And you really shouldn't, but when you're hiking the PCT and you're out in the middle of nowhere, a lot of the times the only way to get from the trailhead to, and you get to the road, and there's 15 miles of freeway or highway or just a road, and you're like, well, I'm not going to walk extra <laughs> to go there when I'm going to save my, all the walking for the PCT, so you stick out your thumb. And most of the time, these people in these communities, they know who you are. They know you're hiking the PCT. They know you're probably not a real homeless person. Um, and, and for the most part, the community is incredibly generous, incredibly kind. There's this concept of um, trail magic, where people who want to support you will meet you at a, on the trail and like give you food or give you water or cook you a burger or like, hey, do you want to come to my house and use my shower and sleep on my floor? And you're like, thank you. <laughs> and that happened to me a bunch of times. And then some people just shuttle you into town, and it's the most magical thing. And the people who do that are what we call trail angels, trail angels. which is a term um, that we use a lot. This middle picture is, uh, well, I'm in the front, but the rest of the hikers and all of our gear are in the, in the back, and we were hitchhiking into town. This uh, mm -hmm. man who picked us up, really nice. Uh, the lower corner here, my friends Seabiscuit and Sizzle employ the hitchhike dancing routine where you're like, maybe someone will pick me up if I'm dancing. Um, yeah. And then more pictures of, this is a real typical picture there of the afternoon siesta where you get to like a little patch of shade and everyone, you know, you're just out for a few hours trying to get some rest. All right. From there, um, hike, continued hiking north through Cajun, uh, Cajun Cajon Pass. Um, the, the, especially the Southern California section of the PCT is an interesting mix of desert wilderness area. And you've been in the wilderness for a few days and it's so amazing. And then you're just like, ah, I just kind of want a shower and maybe a burger. <laughs> ah, and some ice cream. <laughs> and then you come over a, 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 a rise in the hill and then you see the interstate up ahead and you're like, yes, the interstate. <laughs> um, the trail actually goes underneath the interstate there so you can kind of see like a, a tunnel and then you go underneath. But like right before the interstate as you go into Cajon, uh, Cajon Pass, 
there's the one time on the PCT, there's actually a PCT sign with a, a sign for McDonald's, point four <laughs> off of the trail. <laughs> so this is in the middle of nowhere, like an intersection of like three uh, highways and a, and a railroad. Um, and then uh, just this truck stop in the middle of nowhere. So yeah, we all went there and had some McDonald's and then and kept going. And there's this sort of interesting, interesting juxtaposition of the, and when you are out in the wilderness for a few days and you go into town, it's overwhelming, like cars going by and you go into the, the mini mart and you're just like, <laughs> wow, there's like 20 cans of candy bars. Like, I don't know, this is too much for me right now. I want to go back outside. <laughs> Um, it's it's kind of it's uh, it takes a while to adjust from going from one to the other. Um, another cool thing that I did in that part of uh, the stretch of the trail is uh, summit Mount Baden Powell, which is I don't remember the elevation, but I remember it was higher than Mount San Jacinto, um, and that that was another incredible um, little peak. There's like the hike kind of going up to the top, and right there um, that this tree, the cool one of the coolest trees I'd seen up to that point on the trail. There was a sign next to it saying it was like over a thousand years old. Pretty amazing tree. And that's with my friend uh, Stefan, trail named Dr. Ping. <laughs> and so um, at this point in the trail, um, I'd been hiking for a little over a month. Um, and uh, the trail got to the point where it was kind of close to LA. Actually, I took an Uber into LA <laughs> from the Acton KOA campground. And I met Daniel who uh, he flew down and we got at a hotel uh, hotel and he's like, all right, let's see LA. And I'm, no, let's see this hotel bed. And I'm just going to lay here and get room service. And it's like soft sheets, ah, Wi-Fi, yes, a shower. That was really great. Let's watch some TV in bed. Um, but uh, those, those luxuries are really nice when you've just been sleeping on the ground for a long time. But after a couple days getting back on the trail, it was hard. I was really missing Daniel. It's really hard when you have a f family back home. And, um, and I, it was sort of coming clear to me that I was just not going fast enough. And you know, I wanted to do that traditional through hike where you start from Mexico and you go to Canada and you do the whole thing in six months and you have to go fast before it starts snowing in the Cascades. And that means you really got to be doing 20, 25, 30 mile days. Um, in the beginning, you don't go that fast because you're trying to get up to, to speed, and I just wasn't getting up to speed, and it was, it was really bumming me out. It was really getting me down, and uh, I, was just, I was just feeling pretty low, and this is a picture. I've been crying in my tent, texting Daniel, feeling pretty depressed, and it's, it's not always easy, right? A lot of it is psychological, although I had read this book before I left called Pacific Crest Trials, a psychological and emotional guide to successfully through hiking the trail <laughs> and before I left. So I knew a lot of it was in your mind. So um, the night before I left, I it recommends you write yourself a letter. So I got out my letter where I encouraged myself that I was a magical unicorn and I could do it. I'm like, okay, I guess so. <laughs> um, so the next day after this night, um, all of my friends were at this uh, a famous trail angel's house. It was called Casa de Luna, and they were all gonna go, and they, they have this pizza salad, taco salad night every night, and it's supposed to be this super amazing place, and I was like, ah, yeah, I just, I, don't, I can't go. Like, I'm not going fast enough. I just need to keep hiking. So I'm sitting by the side of the road um, at the ranger station, just like eating oatmeal again, feeling kind of bummed out. And then, uh, this woman up here on the upper right, Terry Anderson. Everybody knows Terry Anderson. She's, she runs Casa de Luna. And she just comes up to me like this. Like, the idea of a hug was happening, whether I wanted to or not. Like, here comes a hug. And I'm like, okay. She's like, I'm Terry Anderson. I'm like, I, okay, I'm in the car. And she's like, you're coming to my house today. I'm like, okay. <laughs> just my arm. And um, it was amazing. I have to say this was like the turning point in my hike. Um, just, just. I hadn't planned on taking this day off, and that means that I didn't have to do any town chores. Usually when you have a, what we call a zero day, which is a day when you don't hike, that means you spend a day doing laundry and calling your people back home and doing your resupply box and mailing yourself packages and going to the bank, and it's just all chores, right? Well, I didn't plan to take this day off. I didn't have to do any chores. I just like, you know, we laid around in hammocks, <laughs> we colored rocks, uh, they had a barbecue, we sat around and drank beer, and um, 
It was just, oh, they make everyone wear a Hawaiian shirt. You come up and they're like, here's a Hawaiian shirt. Here's 20 to choose from. And, and it was just this super laid back atmosphere there. I, need, I needed a, a, a trail mom for the day and she, she was there and I really appreciated that. So after that, I felt really recharged and I just kind of was like, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna finish the whole trail. But you know, it doesn't matter. We have this saying in the hiking community called hike your own hike. I'm gonna hike my hike, and for me, my hike means I'm gonna go as far as I can at the speed that, as fast as I can, that's comfortable for me while I'm still having fun, and get as much of the PCT. I wanna hike the whole PCT at some point. I'm gonna go as many miles as I can this year. So I kinda had a bit of an attitude adjustment and, and kept going. Soon I got to the 500 mile marker. This is like, woo, big deal, 500 miles. And then we all sing that song, I will walk 500 miles. And I think that was really clever. Um, yeah. Um, shortly after that, we came into this, uh, this, one of the trail stops that you go through is called Hiker Town, which is this kind of like fake Western, a faux Western town. Um, the pictures here make it look kind of cool. It's actually really run down, and there's like some cockroaches there, and <laughs> lovely, gross. Um, there's a source of debate between hikers. Some people are like, oh, it's so gross, and I'm like, well, compared to nothing, I don't know. Uh, but um, this is the walk in the hiker town, just kind of going through this valley. It was kind of beautiful. Um, this is more trail laundry, where you're doing your old school style. Yeah, no. he's washing his clothes in that picture. Um, and his feet. Yeah, and his feet at the same time. Yeah. Um, two for win. So I just went into Hiker Town. We got there at like 10 in the morning. We did a, a little rest and then had a siesta and then hiked out. Um, the next big thing after Hiker Town, which is one of the most famous things on the trail, is you go through the LA Aqueduct. And the LA Aqueduct, there's 20 or 30 miles where you're following the aqueduct that brings the water from the mountains and brings it down to LA. And part of that, part of the aqueduct is uncovered, like the picture you see in the top corner. And then part of it, it it's covered. And then you can literally walk on the aqueduct. Um, and we walked along that for a ways. Um, it's, it's in the valley floor, it's quite warm. And so a lot of people just uh, employ a strategy of um, doing it at night. So we thought we'd do it at night, and everyone, like, you can put, <laughs> you put your headlamps on, and some people have, like, a blinking, like, red headlamp, and then it kind of feels like you're at, like, a rave, and everyone's, like, <laughs> playing music, and then <laughs> um, I was hiking with this group, and then we found this other group, and then we started having a dance off, and it was really fun. But anyway, that's the LA <laughs> Aqueduct. Yeah. There's so many hours, cool. and then what are you going to do when you're hiking for many hours? Well, you just, you have fun with it, right? Um, this is the next morning I woke up and it really started to feel like the desert. Just this, here we are, woke up to this, can't complain, right? Like, super beautiful. Um, all right, let's talk about some of the wildlife. Um, Southern California, uh, quite a few rattlesnakes, so that's definitely a fact of life uh, in lots of parts of the PCT. Uh, the first time I heard a rattle, I jumped like 20 miles in the air and I was terrified. And the guy I was hiking with halfway, he was like, oh, whatever. And I'm like, how can you not be terrified right now? Well, after a few hundred miles, I was, maybe I didn't jump 10 feet, maybe I did one foot. Um, the nice thing though is they do rattle at you to let you know not to get any closer. It's the other snakes that don't rattle at you that you have to worry about. So, um, I think one of the coolest things that happened on the trip, the coolest um, animal sightings that I saw, because I don't, no one else saw this but me, is I got to see this fox up there. Mm -hmm. Actually, got a, he's got his like his tongue. I don't know if you can really see. He's like licking his snout or something. And I don't know what this little guy is, but I got a picture of him. Yeah. What's the middle one? That is like a fuzzy caterpillar on my skirt. Oh! I looked down at my skirt and there was a little fuzzy caterpillar on my skirt and he thought I was a leaf. And I was like, oh, how cute. And then he wouldn't get off. So I had to get a leaf and like, here you go. Go somewhere, not on me. <coughs> All right. Through this section of Southern California, there was, turns out there's a lot of wind farms. So sometimes we're just hiking by these enormous windmills wind farm after wind farm after wind farm. It was pretty cool. Oh yeah, another picture of us drinking non-potable water. Never, that never gets old. <laughs> and then we get into the, the actual Mojave Desert. 
And yeah, we're in the Mojave Desert. Um, this is, by this point, we've been hiking in like 600 miles of desert. I was starting to get mildly tired of desert hiking. <laughs> Still really beautiful, but it was starting to wear a little thin, uh, especially at this section of trail. This is one of the most famous waterless stretches, 30 miles without water. You gotta be prepared for this. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do. You can either just carry lots of water, uh, you can get off, do 15 or so, and there's a place where you can get off the trail and hike 10 miles out to get water and back. Like, how do you, how do you handle this? Um, luckily for us, there's some water, um, some trail angels who stash, uh, to stock a couple of water caches at strategic points through this section. So there's people looking out for us, and you, you show up, and there's like giant jugs, and you fill your water bottles. But you can't count on that, right? Like, what if the hiker, what during what we call like the, the middle of hiker season, when they're, you're in the middle of the herd or the bubble, where there could be 100 hikers going through in one day, all really thirsty, that you, they could just like, like that, there's no more water, just go through the whole cache. So, so I, was, I, I, I think I carried seven liters, which is like, 14, 15 pounds of water, that was really heavy. And then you would, uh, right here, uh, you would like take a siesta under one of these like crazy prickly trees because there's no other place of, of shade around there. So we spent a whole afternoon there laying underneath one of these trees and, uh, and then the sun would move and then your shade would move so he would have to move, yeah. Oh, I think we got bit by ants under that tree too. But yeah, that was really fun. Um, this is when I met my friend Monarch, who I ended up hiking with for quite a bit. She's got her own shade umbrella. Pretty handy when you're going through the desert. Um, came to make Isabella, uh, which is a trail town off of the PCT. I would like to point out this picture of us in the local Lake Isabella Library here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, they were really kind to us. Uh, we, we, you know, they, they gave us all like uh, passwords so we can get on the internet even though we were local. And um, we were at this point in the trail, uh, there's uh, Gabby in the lower right who is here today. Hi Gabby. <laughs> um, we, we were uh, planning our, how are we gonna plan our trip through the high Sierras? We knew it was a really high snow year and we'd been monitoring the snow melts and we decided to do some research at the local library when we got to Lake Isabella. So, also we had a, um, a Lord of the Rings marathon <laughs> up here. Yeah, like this crew here, like um, they'd been talking about the Lord of the Rings for about five days straight. And um, we, when we got to Lake Isabella, we were gonna watch uh, the first movie, right? So we get there and we get to the hotel room and there's no way to watch a movie. On, like it was a really old hotel room. We're like, well, there's no, Okay, so anyway, they went to like the, the Value Village and found a, a DVD tape of the first movie, and then they, they bought a combo TV player with it, with the, not DVD, it was a VCR, it was a VHS tape, yeah, one of those, and they bought a combo TV with the VHS player in it, and carried it back to the hotel room, and then we watched, yeah, that was, we were determined. <clears throat> Soon we're uh, ready to exit the desert, and um, this is sort of as the, the end of the desert, as we're just starting, to, the biome was kind of starting to change into high, into the sort of high mountain range. We hit 700 miles, that was a really big deal! Um, and then soon we were at Kennedy Meadows. Those of you familiar with the PCT will know Kennedy Meadows is one of the, one of the biggest milestones on the PCT. When you hit Kennedy Meadows, it's sort of the, the acknowledge like, okay, you're done with the desert, you're about to enter the Sierras. This is where you send your packages with your ice axe and your and winter gear and you're ready to like deal with the Sierras. So uh, when you get to the Sierras, you get to the, uh, the Kennedy Meadows General Store and you walk up to the store and everyone on the deck who's sitting around like working on the resupply boxes, they get up and they give you a standing ovation. Aww. And it is really exciting. So um, it was a big deal when we got there. Uh, when we got to Kennedy Meadows, uh, at this point, um, some of my friends and I decided we were not going to do the high Sierras at that time. Uh, a very high snow year last year, like I already mentioned. And if we wanted to go through the Sierras in order to, um, with early enough in the season to actually make it so we can make it to Canada at the end of the season, it meant going through in June. That's not hiking, that's mountaineering. Um, that means getting up at four in the morning and hiking uh, it's 80 degrees every day, but you're still hiking with 
feet and feet and feet of snow. By the mid-afternoon, it's all turned into slush, and if you are going, you are post hauling up to your knees or higher. It's um, tricky, so people usually get up super early and they hike when it's things are still kind of frozen. And I was like, I don't know, that doesn't sound super fun. I don't think I'm down for that. So, um, what else do you do, right? So, do you wait a month? Um, uh, with my friends and I, decided that we would skip up to another section of the trail that wasn't buried under tons of snow. Uh, well, where do you go? Uh, it turns out there was still a lot of snow almost everywhere except for Northern California. So like Oregon was out, Washington was out, even in the middle of June I couldn't have done those other sections of trail um, unless I wanted to be dealing with lots of snow. So we decided to bounce ahead. But before we did, um, I sort of got ahead of myself, Kennedy Meadows as we decided to bounce ahead, but we still were like, okay, we still have 50, we can go 50 more miles before we really hit the snow. So we got we got to hike between Kennedy Meadows at mile 700 and uh, Lone Pine at mile 750. And you're just getting into the beginning of the high Sierras and just getting a taste, um, getting up at elevation. When I got to up to Trail Pass, where then I, well, this is Horseshoe Meadow, and you're just starting to get this sense of like what the Sierras are going to be. But you can see there's quite a bit of snow up there. Um, so this is where I came off of the trail and. It was like, so it was hard. But I saw all that snow up there, and I, I'm not a big snow person, so I was like, you know, it's time, it's time to go. 10,000 feet there. And then I got in the bus, and the great thing is if you ever get a chance to take the Eastern Sierra Transit between Bishop, Lone Pine, and Reno, it just goes right along. It's, it is a beautiful ride, and it's only like 30 bucks. <laughs> and it's like a five-hour ride, and you just go right along the Sierras. And it's just the most amazing view. So I got to see the Sierras through the window mm -hmm. of the bus. Was it air conditioned? Yes. Uh. <laughs> it was. All right. That was part one. And I should go a little faster. So, um, so I skipped ahead to Northern California. Um, actually, technically, I skipped ahead to Ashland, which is like Southern Oregon. And I decided to start hiking southbound. My initial plan was I'll hike southbound and just do the Sierra southbound. But of course that plan didn't happen. Uh, but we'll, I'll get more on that later. So I got up to Ashland, started hiking southbound through just one or two, I was in at Oregon for one day and then I was in Northern California, I crossed into the border there. And wow, what a difference. I had been hiking in 700 miles of desert and now I get to hike in this, right? Like right. everything is green and not just like high desert forest green, but like lush, beautiful, the kind of green we're used to here in the Pacific Northwest, like moss, and it was so nice, and there were streams, and you didn't have to like, okay, I'm going to take my afternoon siesta, and I think there might be a creek, and it was just so nice. Water everywhere, a really nice welcome change. Normally when you're on the PCT, you don't change that quickly between environment, it's kind of more gradual, and to just go from one to the other was, was sort of incredible. But it's not like we didn't have any snow. We were hiking around Mount Ashland, and wow, there was still quite a bit of snow. Um, we had to do a bit of route finding where there was no trail. You had to have your GPS navigation. We even used paper maps once. Um, and then uh, here, my friend Monarch fell into a, a, a tree well while I, there was a log there, and she broke her hiking pole. Um, here, we did this quite the first big traverse we went across where we really had to get out our ice axes. <coughs> um, and it was, we were fine, but it was, it was steep and it was snowy and it, it's not, we didn't, it's not, it was like we didn't have any snow at that point. I got to say though, like I did feel like I was kind of in the sound of music at this point where I'm with my friends and we're up in the middle of these beautiful mountains and at that, it wasn't all snow. It's a lot of snow though. And it was just incredible. Views of um, Shasta, which mountain is that? So many mountains, that's Shasta and just up in the snow and around up in the mountains, pretty beautiful. However, when we, we hiked through the uh, section from Ashland to Syed Valley, we did feel like as a group I was with, there was five of us women who were hiking together and we, we didn't feel super comfortable at that level of snow. And the next section going through Etna and the Marble Mountains, we had heard from the hikers going northbound, ooh, that's even gonna be more snow at that time. It was still pretty snowy. And we were like, hmm, no, no, don't feel safe. We 
we didn't feel safe. We actually had an incident where we got, you, you think you're going to hike together, and you know it's safe to hike together, but you know, you can only hike together so much before you get on each other's nerves, and you need a little <laughs> personal space. And you're like, you're coming along, and then your friend's going to come along later, and they're listening to their music, and then they want to take 10, uh, 20 minutes and text with their mom or something. So, And just like that, you get separated, and you get to like a, oh, wow, there's this big ice, icy thing that we all try to climb over and I tried to climb over it by myself and I did it in a very unsafe way and I got really scared and then we were like we decided that we didn't feel comfortable continuing to hike uh, in that level of snow so we got to side valley this is us having a uh, we all sat down and had a discussion and we decided to skip the next couple hundred miles that were still pretty snowy um, and and we did so we stopped in side valley we ended up going to this local little hoop nanny that we got invited to where I met this guy who's a cowboy poet. And <laughs> then this guy, Ed, was like, hey, you guys can stay at our house. It didn't help, but we were all like young ladies. And he, uh, he was really nice. And then he drove us uh, the next day to Cabazon. Um, not Cabazon. Where was it? Dunsmere. To Dunsmere, where the PCT crosses the I-5. And we got back on and we started hiking south down again. So we missed another 100 miles there. But at this point, we were no, there was no more snow. So another view of Mount Shasta, the PCT in Northern California like, goes up like this and does this crescent around Mount Shasta and keeps going north. And that whole time, you get these just incredible, amazing views. Wow. Continuing southbound, we went through the town of Bernie. And Bernie is famous for the beautiful Bernie Falls. Um, there's a dam that goes nearby. So we walked over this dam. And then there's the Bernie Mountain guest house. It's just, a, it's just a family that opens their house to PCT hikers and they have a swimming pool that they let you swim in and you can camp in their yard and pretty nice place. Okay, Northern California wildlife, lots of cows. Um, I didn't have any negative cow stories, but some people were really scared of the cows. Um, I almost stepped on that scorpion, it's the only one I saw. Um, PCT hikers, when they stop to take a break, the first thing they do is take off their socks and shoes to let their feet breathe. For me, I learned the best way to prevent blisters was to change my socks frequently. And so I would always have a pair of socks clipped to the back of my backpack to dry, and then I would, I would keep cycling through them. So you stop, you take your shoes off, and then I almost stepped on that little guy. Uh, but I just took a stick and was like, Psh, you're... You're going to go over there now. Um, more rattlesnakes. Saw lots of deer. Lots of ants. I got stung by a bee once. It was only once for six months. That's not bad, right? No. So, this is one of my most memorable nights. I'm um, hiking with my five friends. Well, I think there's four friends. Five of us? Whatever. <laughs> so, we get to the hat. Uh, this is one of the more, no another notorious dry stretch called Hat Creek Rim. And you do have to sort of be prepared for the amount of water that you need. And there is a, a water cache up there that's maintained. Um, in Cheryl Strayed's book, Wild, this is where she runs out of water, is on Hat Creek Rim. Mm -hmm. um, for us, though, after hike, Cheryl Strayed didn't do the whole desert. She, she started at the Mojave, so she, she started at like mile 600. Cheater. Well, <laughs> it's called Hike Your Own Hike. She <laughs> hiked her hike. I choose to hike a different hike. <laughs> um, but when you hike that much in the desert, you get really acclimated. You don't need as much water. And so it, it, it didn't phase us. We're like, this isn't that. But also we hiked southbound, so we got to go to the water cache, and I think it made it easier logistically. But we were up on the top of Hat Creek Rim by this observation tower, and we decided to spend the night. And it was just like super amazing, gorgeous views with Mount Lassen. You could see Mount Lassen to the south and Mount Shasta to the north, and it was just, it was an incredible evening. Um, one, one of the better nights of my trip. Continuing southbound, then we went through Mount uh, Lassen Volcanic National Park. Because we had skipped around in a weird way, it was my first national park that I'd been to. Those of you who know me, and I, I'm sort of obsessed with national parks. Anyway, um, it's a volcanic national park, and so it has this sort of like stuff going on in the geology underneath the soil, and so you get these like s warm hot springs and sulfuric stuff kind of coming out of the ground. So that was pretty cool. We also went swimming in this lake. There was snow and ice on that lake, but we jumped in it. It was very brisk, and then we came out. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hiked like 20 feet on the trail right there. Oh, you did? I stayed in a cabin up there. <laughs> it's super beautiful up there. 
Um, they also have requirements through here on the PCT that you're required to carry a bear can for your food or you don't stop. Um, you're not allowed to just stop and camp without a bear can. So most hikers like sort of employ different strategies where you just hike all the way through or you hike into the middle where there's a campground with a bear box and you put your food in there. But it was my first time kind of having to pay attention to certain regulations. There's some bears that got um, friendly and they're trying to keep them from um, wanting to eat everyone's food. <coughs> this is my another hiker trash picture. Um, top picture in the middle, uh, there's this guy, what's his name, Gary something, and he, he was hiking with this horse. He actually had two horses and his wife was a his support person. Every night they would agree where to meet and she would drive the horse trailer with the other horse. And then um, she would wait for him to get there, they would meet up and they would switch horses and they would do it again every day. And their horse trailer was all tricked out. It wasn't just a horse trailer, like they slept in it. She made cookies. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. <laughs> um, this is where I met Gabby and Dave right here and uh, they elected to do this section northbound and we did it southbound and so when we met up it was like yeah hey guys <laughs> like going southbound we got to meet up with so many people going northbound and it was it was pretty fun uh, another siesta this isn't a two brick block of cheese and yes she brought this on the trail you would bring out cheese with you and after about day four, it would sort of get a little especially funky. Um, but yeah, she ate the whole thing. Um, yeah. You, I went out for breakfast one time with a friend of mine and he ordered two entrees for breakfast and then ate half of mine. This is not a joke. Um, I have a picture actually of that coming up later and he's gaunt. He is super skinny and I, yeah. Um, you can, you just know he's going through like 6,000 calories a day. That was pretty insane. Yeah. Um, this one woman uh, adopted this kitten and was taking her on the trail. So of course I had to get some pictures of the kitten. That was pretty exciting. I felt Got the same cat? Yeah. That's the same kitten. Oh. Yeah. I don't know if that was the best thing to bring a cat on the trail, but it was sure pretty cute. Um, here. Yeah, this is one of my most uh, most favoritist. That's not great speaking there. But um, I'll let the picture do the talking. Um, this is the Sierra Buttes. So most of the time when people get to the Sierra Buttes, they've already been hiking northbound through the Sierras, and this is like, uh, whatever. Well, I hadn't been through the Sierras yet, and when I saw this, I just knocked my socks off. Uh, I definitely wanted, this is an area I'd like to go back to. And when you go to the Sierra Buttes, you can, you can drive. There's like lots of car camping stuff up there. Lots of places to just enjoy uh, the Sierra Buttes. Super beautiful. On a not so beautiful note, this is around the time when I started not feeling well. Um, I have a, a chronic condition called ulcerative colitis, and had, which had been in remission, and then was not in remission during this time. So even though this was super beautiful, I remember this and I just remember not fun times. Let's just say if you've got a chronic condition that involves the bathroom and there's no bathroom, it's like not fun. So um, I, for a while I thought I could sort of deal with it. It just got worse and worse and then I decided I got to get off the trail and I got to get this taken care of. I got to see a doctor. So I got off the trail in Sierra City uh, and I was like, okay, civilization. Well, no cell service. The only Wi-Fi was at this Sierra City country store, which was spotty. And I'm like, I got to call my doctor. I need to, I need to get out of here. Um, so yeah, I wasn't there long. I was there long enough. I went into the, the post office and he was very excited to show us Cheryl Strait's entry of when she went through here in 1995. She, yeah, he was super excited to show us this. Um, from, from there, I, uh, I got a ride with a friend to Trek to California and then I took an Uber to, <laughs> hello, thank you, Uber, uh, from Truckee to South Lake Tahoe where I stayed in a hostel uh, for a week while I was recovering from my illness. Um, and I just was hoping I would go into remission and it would get better on its own. Um, and I stayed there for a week, during which time uh, a bunch of my friends were hiking through, some going northbound, some going southbound, and I had a lot of fun times. The middle picture is of us, of us having a foosball tournament. So I uh, this is Seabiscuit and Seabiscuit. 
two hikers that didn't know each other that chose the same trail name, <laughs> right? And I've been hiking with boy Sea Biscuit for quite a bit, and we've been hearing about girl Sea Biscuit, and he's like, yeah, no, she's going down. That's my trail name. No. If we ever see her, you know. So when we met her, she turned out to be super awesome, and we're like, okay, we we need to we need to have like a some sort of some sort of way to decide who gets to keep the trail name. <laughs> I mean, you can have more than one, but we were, it was just fun. So we decided to have this tournament, this foosball tournament on who got to keep the trail name. Uh, she won, and uh, we were like, yeah, you get to name him now. And she's like, well, I'm going to call you Ocean Cookies. You know, it's like Sea Biscuit, but it's going to be Ocean Cookies. <laughs> he was like, we still call them Sea Biscuit. <laughs> um, well, you know, I didn't include a picture of, okay, well, pretend there's a picture here of Halfway looking super gaunt. His face, um, this is, ha well, you can barely see him here, but he, sh he shaved, that's one thing, but like, you could just see he had lost all this weight through his face, because he went through the Sierras. I didn't go through the Sierras at that time. Anyway, well, <clears throat> after a week in this hostel, I realized I'm still not getting better. I needed to go home. I needed to see Dr. Carlson at the Swedish Gastroenterology Center and get my stuff taken care of. So Dr. I did. Dr. Daniel. Yeah. Well, I got to come home to see Daniel, too, so that was really awesome. Uh, I missed him a lot. Uh, I got to see Jonathan and Sarah Beth and Ben, went to the park. Um, so I, I got another. So I was off the trail for about a total of a little over three weeks. Got better. Got a bunch of medication I had to bring with me. Uh, which turned out to be heavy and cumbersome and not convenient uh, that I had to keep picking up at the pharmacy and mailing ahead to myself. But I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't ready to stop hiking. Whatever it took, I was going to keep going. So now we're on part three. Um, at this point, I've been hiking with this. So I, I haven't explicitly stated this yet, but I, I hiked alone, right? Like I didn't, I, I didn't plan to hike with anyone. Um, but I knew that I would meet people along the way, and as you saw, I've been hiking with various groups of people. Um, but ultimately, I was by myself. I had only myself to answer to, um, and so I could choose to hike as many miles a day that I wanted. Um, although I had chosen to hike with certain groups at certain periods of time, it was always an agreement, like we would talk about it, and if we decided it didn't work out, we would just split up. So I got separated from my group, and they were like, hey, you should come back and hike with us. But they were three weeks ahead of where I wanted to be. And I was like, you know, I, I don't want to hike that section right now. And also I wanted to see what it would be like to hike solo, to be completely on my own. So I elected to strike out on my own. So I thought I could go back to Sierra City and keep going southbound. But I knew from the northbound hikers coming through as I was about to get into the, the Sierras where there was going to be snow. And it hadn't quite all melted yet. And it was still another a oh, few weeks to a month before it was going to melt. And if I was by myself, I didn't feel comfortable tackling that by myself. So I decided to go back to Northern California and skip the 150 miles that I skipped. Uh, hike the 150 miles that we had skipped earlier in the Marble Mountains Wilderness. And I did this by myself. So I started at Dunsmuir, California. I remember one morning I woke up at home and I flew to Ashland. And from there I took a bus to Weed. And then I took another bu a county bus, and then I hitchhiked. And it took me all day, but I eventually got to Castle to Dunsmuir, where um, I got off and started hiking through Castle Craig State Park. Really beautiful. This is Castle Craig's over there. Mm. Um, and then I was hiking in the Trinity Alps Wilderness. I still hadn't hiked through the through the real the Sierras yet, and this was just really incredible. One of one of my favorite definite sections of trail that I got to hike through. Sadly, not long after I hiked through this section, it got um, closed due to wildfires. Yeah. I don't know if this section of trail is still open or not. Um, we'll find out when the season starts, but um, the hikers behind me didn't get to hike this because the, the trail was closed. Um, some more of the sort of just this gorgeous, craggy, beautiful beauty of the uh, Marble Mountains. Um, up here on the, the upper corner here is a picture of me with Papa Joe, Papa Joe Anderson. Married to Terry Anderson from Casa de Luna. So I ran into him, and uh, he's like, hey, I bet you went to my house earlier. I'm like, I don't know. Who are you? I'm like, Papa Joe. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Um, so he section hikes the PCT every year, um, chunk by chunk. So I got to hike with him for a little bit. 
So this was this was a cool section. Blackberry season, and then I made it back to Sayed Valley, and then I hitchhiked to Ashland, and then uh, this goat here is at Callahan's. This goat like ate some food right out of my hand that I wasn't feeding him. <laughs> uh, this is a wrapper and all. It was just like. <laughs> Woo! All right, man. Um, uh, aggressive goats at Callahan's. Kind of adorable. All right, so then I got to the state of Oregon. I was like, going northbound. Okay, no more skipping. I just want to go like straight to Canada and just, just have a continuous hike the rest of the way. I've, I've skipped around so much at this point, I'm, I'm done with that. Now, that was my plan. Um, so I started hiking north. From Ashland, the, one of the first things on the trail is you go by this this uh, peak called Pilot Rock. I got to camp and just have this gorgeous view of the rock there. Mm -hmm. And then um, continued hiking northbound, went by Fish Lake Resort. Um, went through, a, uh, Oregon is really famous for like lava fields, which are super not awesome on your feet, rocky and uncomfortable. Um, Oregon is also famous for an easier elevation profile than the rest of the PCT. So, um, you don't tend to have the, the same elevation ascent and decline. So hikers will typically say, oh, when we get to Oregon and we can do 30, 40 mile days. Um, I wasn't that fast, but I did my longest days in Oregon. So at that point I, I had, be, prior to that, I've been averaging 17 to 20 mile days. Uh, when I got to Oregon, I was doing 20 mile days consistently, 22, and my biggest day was in Oregon, uh, 25 and a half miles in one day. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Um, because of, you weren't going up and down so much. And also I was in better shape and I, I had knew what I was doing a little better. But, you know, my continuous footsteps where I wasn't going to skip any of the more of the PCT didn't last that long because there was a huge wildfire, like multiple wildfires at Crater Lake. And now I'm entering wildfire season. So um, we had to get off of the trail. The, the closure started at the southern border of Crater Lake. And at the southern border of Crater Lake National Park, there's no way to egress from there. So they're actually 10 miles south of there. They're like, you gotta get off the trail here. So I got off the trail at Trail Pass. I'm walking in and um, <clears throat> I decided, well, you know, there's this whole concept that long distance hikers have of continuous footsteps. There's always gonna be some section of the trail that's closed. And there's usually some way that you can walk around it. And if you just keep walking in a continuous footstep all the way to Canada, doing as most of the PCT as you can, you, you've hiked the PCT, you've done it. Right? So I was like, okay, well if I just go on this down on this trail to this to this forest service road and walk down another ten miles to this main free highway that goes up into Crater Lake, that's good enough. And then I won't have to come back and do this section later. I'll have done it. So I hadn't been feeling very well. I'd been fighting a bug. I noticed that my food bag was fuller than it should have been. That's not normal. Me being not hungry, not normal. So I'm like, I need a day off. So I get off the trail, I walk 10 miles on these Forest Service roads into the town of Fort Klamath, or near the town of Fort Klamath, close enough to get cell reception. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna like, there's like three guest houses in Fort Klamath. I'm gonna call one and get a bed for the night and I will sleep and I will get over this bug that I've been fighting. So, well, I didn't quite realize it was like close to the eclipse and everyone was in Oregon to see the eclipse. Oh. All the hotels were booked. Uh, yeah, so, but there was one place that had one room, and she was like, yeah, I got this one room, there was a cancellation, you should you come on down. I'm like, all right. She's like, how long is it going to take you? I'm like, well, oh, you know, it'll take me about an hour to walk there. And she's like, oh, wait, are you a hiker? And I'm like, yeah, and she's like, you can't stay here. We don't rent to hikers. I was like, oh, no, but I'm a clean, nice hiker. And she's like, you know, you guys are dirty. I, I just, I've had some bad experiences. I won't rent to you. And I was just like, okay. And I hung up the phone and I was just like, just started crying. I was like, oh, this is so awful. And then this guy, this guy came by, he's like, you need a ride? And I'm like, I don't care about continuous footsteps anymore. I'll just do the section again later. <laughs> so he gave me a ride to the, um, the highway. And at the highway, there's a picture of me hitchhiking. Um, uh, some friends of mine were sitting on the other side of the street hitchhiking. Actually, they were waiting for their parents who were meeting them in a camper van, and they were taking them on a holiday to Crater Lake. But anyway, um, so I'm on the side of the road. I'm hitchhiking in this enormous 
RV goes by, like roars by. And I'm like, oh man, I wish they would have stopped. Like they have a huge RV. They have room for me. And like 10 minutes later, they had turned around and they came roaring back. I'm like right next to me, facing the wrong way in the middle of the highway. And they open up the door and they're like, hey, you wanna get in? We're going to Crater Lake. And I'm like, sure. So I get in and it's this Australian couple who came here to see the eclipse and they rented an RV, and they're not used to driving on the right side of the road. <laughs> yeah, and they're like, yeah. But I, I actually super admired them because I would be terrified of that, and they didn't care. They're like, woo, we're on holiday, like, eclipse, like, yeah. So they gave me a ride to Crater Lake, and we're like going along the road, and they're like, oh, look, it's a viewpoint. You want to see the viewpoint? And I'm like, sounds great. They pull over, we get out and take a picture, we get back in, and... Uh, they dropped me off in uh, Mazama Village, which is in the south part of Crater Lake. And um, um, I was still feeling pretty sick. And so I, uh, I, was, I stayed there two nights. Um, there was a cancellation. I was able to get a room in a, in a place, uh, one of those lodges in Crater Lake. Um, I was a little upset that they didn't have, they were like, it's, it's, it's so relaxing here. There's no TV and there's no Wi-Fi, so you can really get away. And I'm like, oh, that's the only thing I want. <laughs> I've, had enough, I've had enough time in the woods. Um, so at this point, I get to Crater Lake, and um, there's a lot of smoke there. And I heard from other folks that, well, if you go by, if you hike by the lake in the afternoon, there's so much smoke, you can't even see the lake. So you should see it in the morning because in the morning this air clears out and then in the by the afternoon the smoke kind of comes in and then you can't see the lake. So I was like, okay, what I'll do is I'll hike out in the afternoon, I'll get up to the rim, and then I'll start hiking um, along the rim and I'll, there's a place to camp. Off of the, you can't camp on the rim, you'll get a ticket, don't do it ever, um, but there's a place off of the rim where you can camp. So that was my plan. I'm walking along the rim. I just get up there. I, I can't see the lake. Um, I'll show you that picture next. Uh, and then a forest ranger comes by, and she's like, hey, where are you camping tonight? And I'm like, I'm going to go to Lightning Springs Campground. And she's like, no, you're not. That's closed because of the forest fire. The best campground's 12 miles ahead, way up that way. And it's like 6 p.m. You better get going. By the way, you have a permit. And I'm like, yeah, I got a permit. You want to see it? She's like, no. I was like, damn. <laughs> um, but it was like 6 p.m. I had 12 miles to go. There was beautiful Crater Lake, which I planned to take my time and like commune with the lake. I've, I'd seen Crater Lake before, but I wanted to like really enjoy it. Uh, so I like jog past Crater Lake and I'm like, hello, lake, which I can't see. And then as I'm going, um, the sun starts setting. And as you know, if you've ever been around wildfires, when the sun sets, um, you just have the most amazing sunsets because of all the particulates in the air. So I got to, this is me like sort of hike jogging. Um, <laughs> and then it got really cold. I had to put on my coat. Uh, this is Crater Lake. Um, you can't really see the lake because of all the smoke. But if you've been to Crater Lake before, you know that there's Wizard Island in the middle. So not the experience I was planning to have, but it turned out to be a pretty memorable one. And uh, I still have about 20 miles from Crater Lake going south to do because I had to skip that. So I think Daniel and I will go back and um, I can do those, pick, pick up those miles later. North of Crater Lake, I hiked to Elk Lake Resort and um, saw the eclipse. There's the <coughs> eclipse glasses. Uh, you know, I, at the appointed time, I hiked up to a ridge and put on my glasses and everything got like kind of dusky. And then with, I could see the, the bites taking out of the sun and it was super cool. Um, just kind of by myself in the middle of nowhere. Um, I didn't have a total totality where I was. I was just south of that, but it was still it was still pretty cool. Um, that's down in Peak Wilderness, and then I get to Elk Lake Resort. Elk Lake Resort, I had to skip another hundred miles of the trail due to another forest fire. So um, in the Three Sisters Wilderness, there was quite a few forest fires in the Bend Sisters area this year. So I got off the trail, stayed with some um, hiking friends that I knew who put me up in Bend. And then I got back on the trail at Alawi Lake, had to skip 100 miles. I'm looking forward to doing that section when it reopens. It's supposed to be really beautiful. Uh, I got back um, to Alawi. From Bend, I, had to, I got a ride with someone who um, I had to pay a lot of money to to drive me way out in the middle of the wilderness to this place called Alawi Lake Resort. But it was worth it. I, 
I probably put lots of wear and tear on her car. <laughs> this picture up there is a picture, I, you, I don't know if you can see the smoke, but like we were just driving through smoke and I was really glad I wasn't hiking through that at when, when they were oh. dropping me off. Uh, I got back on the trail at Alali Lake Resort. That's a picture of Devilfish, who um, is a, one of the more famous trail angels. He, he picked me up a couple of times. He would give out his cell number to people and I would use my Delorme, which is a device that you can, um, that connects to satellite and you can send a text via that, and he picked me up in the wilderness one time when I needed a ride. Really nice guy. Made it up to a, a, a Lake Timothy. Um, this is the day where I did my 25 mile day. Camped by this lake, there was all these weird sounds, and then the morning I saw these like otters in the lake. That was pretty cool. And soon I made it to Mount Hood. Um, Mount Hood, I'd never been to before, but I did hike previously hike the Wonderland Trail around Mount Rainier. And they seemed pretty similar, uh, just Mount Hood is smaller. And so I felt kind of like, hey, this is an old friend, uh, new friend, um, but super beautiful. At that point, I continued hiking north uh, between Mount Hood and Cascade Locks. Cascade Locks is another major milestone on the PCT where uh, the PCT crosses into the state of Washington. You cross over the, um, the Bridge of the Gods. And here, Daniel met me and I took three days off. Super nice break. And as we were about to leave, we were across the lake and we were having our anniversary dinner and we were sitting in Stevenson across the lake and we see that. And we're like, huh, what is that? That looks like a forest fire, like a big one, right by our hotel. Whoa, whoa. what's happening? We're pulling out our phones. Um, <clears throat> that's the Eagle Creek fire. So those of you who heard about this, this is the fire where there was like teenagers who threw fireworks on the Labor Day weekend and started this massive forest fire. Uh, I mean, they had ashes falling down in Portland and like uh, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of acres of just beautiful, beautiful forest in that area were all destroyed. Not, not a good scene. So we, we pack up from our, our uh, lunch, our dinner. We go back to our hotel and this is the view of the fire from our hotel. Yeah. Right? We're like, ah, scary! Um, the great thing about being at the hotel, though, is you know you're, they'll, they're in charge of calling you to tell you when it's time to evacuate. We were on a level two evacuation notice, which meant you had to be ready to be evacuated any time. So, um, we did get evacuated at 6 a.m. And we're like, okay, let's go. We'll go across the, the, we'll go across the Columbia River, right? Like, that seems safe. That's far away from the, the fire. So we're about to cross over the Bridge of the Gods, and I was like, hold on, uh, this is the PCT. Like, walking across the Bridge of the Gods, I, I'm not gonna be in the car for that, I gotta walk this. I can't skip these trail miles. So I get out of the car, Daniel drives across, and I walk over the Bridge of the Gods, and it's like 6 a.m. in the morning, and there's like a forest fire right there. <laughs> Here's a picture of me, like, I made it! So. Went into the state of Washington. I only hiked for a couple of days in the state of Washington, but I wasn't comfortable with the forest fire activity. I kept hearing reports of forest fires um, cropping up ahead of me on the trail. Uh, there was 100 miles between White Pass and Stevens Pass that was closed. There was forest fires near the border with Canada that were threatening. Um, a forest fire, have I heard, that were cropped up ahead of me near Chart Lake, which meant I had to get off the trail. And then I heard that the, the Eagle Creek fire skipped over and, and, and spread to the other side of the, the Columbia River. This did happen. Um, it was really scary. I was by myself. I was like, I did not feel safe. So I decided to go home and regroup, which is what I did. And then I thought, hey, you know where there's no fire right now? The High Sierras. It's September. The snow's melted. So I packed my bags, rearranged my resupply boxes again, <laughs> updated my spreadsheet, and then two days later, three days later, I was um, on my way to the High Sierras. So <clears throat> when I went back to, when I went back to um, Horseshoe Meadow, this is the picture I showed you earlier, uh, but this is me taking it again a few months later. There's no snow on the mountains this time. Um, last time I came there, I, I hiked there over a few, you know, I got there by foot to 10,000 feet. That's, that's at an elevation where you might get altitude sickness, right? Um, but when the key to altitude sickness is gradual. acclimatizing slowly, gradual, exactly. This time there was no gradual. I was like, I, I got a ride to 10,000 feet. 
and uh, I got really sick. I mean, I kind of expected it. I wasn't sure. I'd never done that before. And I got super sick. Uh, my first night, I, I got a ride to 10,000 feet and hiked up to 11, went up 1,000 feet. It was just, that was awful. Uh, super nauseous, super dizzy, um, just really tired. I felt awful. And I know it's, it, altitude sickness can be dangerous. When you're at that level of elevation, the best thing you can do is just stop and maybe go down. And so I stopped and I spent the night and I was kind of nervous because I was by myself. Uh, but I kept going. The next day I went back down in elevation. The trail went back down to, to cross a river and I felt a little better. And then went a little further and I'm like, okay, I've been here a couple days. I'm not feeling great, but we'll see. Maybe it'll work its way out. The, at the first, the, at the very southern, so the, the PCT parallels what's called the John Muir Trail to go through the High Sierras. And the southernmost portion of the John Muir Trail where the PCT starts tracking the John Muir Trail is uh, Mount Whitney. Mount Whitney is the highest uh, point in the contiguous United States. It's taller than Mount Rainier. Yeah, it's taller than Mount Rainier. It's like 14,000 whatever feet. It's more than Mount Rainier. But it's, it's, not, it's not glaciated like Mount Rainier. You can, you can hike to the top. There's a trail. <clears throat> and the PCT, uh, if you can, you, there's a site permit you can get from Mount Whitney. It's eight miles up and eight miles down. I was like, of course I'm going to do that. Getting a permit for Whitney is hard to get. They're, um, they don't get those out very easily. So I, I set up my tent. I left all my, head, like my uh, sleeping bag and all the stuff I didn't need. Took my backpack a lighter version of my backpack, got up at four in the morning and I'm like, I'm gonna hike Whitney. So, um, <clears throat> this is the view three quarters of the way up Mount Whitney of what it looks like. This is John Muir's famed range of light. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I really got a, got a chance to see this. Um, when I took this, I was feeling really sick. So, uh, the altitude of sickness was really getting to me. Um, I was, at the one hand, I wanted to go slow and let myself acclimatize from, you know, it went from 10,000 feet to 14,000 feet to get to the top here. But on the other hand, the, the ranger told me that a storm was coming in and you don't want to be up here when there's lightning. Not a good place to be. And he's like, yeah, make sure you're back down. You, you're, you're done around noon and you go back down. So I was like, mm, what do I do? So I would stop and then I would keep going. That's a picture that was closer to the beginning of the trail. And as I got near the top, about two miles from the top, the, the clouds start rolling in. I'm, like, oh, I'm so close. Like, do I stop? I'm like, oh, there's the peak right there. It's not that far. That turned out to be a false peak. Yeah. It was a lot further. <laughs> um, but I kept going. I kept going. Oh, look, it's a sign about extreme danger from lightning. <laughs> right? Um, so I finally made it to the top. I felt super sick. If I wasn't so close to the top, I would have turned around. Um, I made it to this shelter at the top. I signed the book. I was there for about 10 minutes, and then I was back down. Mm -hmm. and, and when I turned around and started going down, that's when the thunder started. Mm -hmm. And just boom, boom. Okay, there was only two, but it was <laughs> enough to, like, <laughs> it scared me. I, um, yeah. I know, I'm really building it up. Like, it was um, it, it was it was terrifying. One of the scariest experiences. I, I'd read this book about these guys that got hit by lightning on Half Dome one time, oh, yeah. and it like scared me forever about being on the top of a mountain with lightning. Yeah, like th multiple people died in that incident. Yeah. Like you don't want to mess around with that. So, I um, at the top of Whitney, like there's a, a two miles where it kind of goes across this ridge, and you're just climbing over these enormous boulders. It's not like a nice smooth path. And then once I got done with those boulders, I was just like um, racing down these switchbacks. And then I got about halfway down, like three or four miles down, and I was like, okay. It's like 2, 3 p.m. I haven't eaten anything all day because I've been super sick. I could probably eat something. <laughs> but I made it down. Okay. But that's, that's my Mount Whitney story. I made it. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever do it again. That was really, really hard. Um, and then just continued hiking north after my Mount Whitney experience. I kind of took a, a, a day that was easier um, before I attempted the next big piece, uh, the first major pass I had to go over, which was Forester Pass, which is the highest elevation that's technically on the PCT. It's like 13,200 feet. And um, so I, uh, I took a, this is like my easy day. The next day I went over Forester Pass. Um, so there's this picture right here. You can kind of see Forrester Pass is up through here. 
-hmm. And then I met these two guys who were hiking the JMT. These guys are from Alaska. They they both hiked Denali twice, and I was like, Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> yeah, um, that's like twenty thousand feet. Yeah. Um, but that's me at the top of Forester Pass, the tallest point on the PCT. That was a pretty big deal. Yeah. Super beautiful. Um, this is Mather Pass, I think, or the view from me going up Mather Pass, and the weather was coming in, and they're just incredible. I, I highly recommend if you've never been to the High Sierras to uh, to check it out. Here's some more pictures of Mather Pass. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say about the High Sierras. It's just like so beautifully, just beautiful. Like, yeah. <clears throat> this is the hut at the top of uh, Muir Pass. This is one of the most more famous, sort of iconic places on the PCT. Um, this is my friends uh, Lisa and Sevi, who are from uh, Switzerland, and I'd hike with them off and on in the desert. And then when I was hiking southbound in Northern California, I passed them around Bernie, and they were hiking northbound. And I was like, oh my gosh, hey guys! Well, then I passed them again. They were doing the Sierras southbound, and I was doing the Sierras northbound in September. And, um, yeah, what are the chances? So it was, I had been already here for about an hour, and I was really cold, and I was ready to go. And then they showed up, and were like, hey, oh my god, you guys, oh! And then we stopped and chit-chatted. So, um, I just sort of fast-forwarded through another hundred miles of the High Sierras. I have, like, thousands of pictures of the High Sierras, but they all look kind of similar, just like, whoa! Um, so I was getting... your tent? That's my tent. Oh. <laughs> so I was getting near Vermilion Valley Resort. I thankfully wasn't at the top of a pass. I was about 9,000 feet, and I woke up to that. And that was really scary. It is not a comfortable feeling being by yourself in the high Sierras uh, when it's snowing. Oh, I forgot to mention earlier, but like, there were some people that died in the high Sierras who tried to go through earlier mm -hmm. um, we, um, because of the high water level. So. I was really glad I didn't try to do the Sierras uh, earlier on in June. It was quite dangerous. Didn't your teacher, like, didn't, weren't you planning to go with someone at, at one point and it didn't work out because the teacher got injured? Yeah, I was going to take a class with someone who was going to take me through the high Sierras um, and teach you snow skills. This was in June. And then he, the class got canceled because he got injured taking another group through. And that was one of the reasons I decided not to go. And like I said, I was really glad I didn't go because there was a couple people who died attempting the high Sierras in June yeah. who got swept away trying to do a, a river crossing. So you don't mess around with being around in the high Sierras by yourself um, when there's weather conditions. And here we had, okay, I only had, at that point, I was at 9,000 feet. I think I got about three inches of snow. But it scared me. It really scared me. Um, I went into Vermilion Valley Resort, and which is you have to get on. They give you a boat ride across the lake, and you stay in this sort of rustic resort in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's really difficult to, to get in and out of there. Um, so I decided to keep going. Um, I, I waited until I found a couple of other people that were going with me, because I go in my direction because I didn't want to go alone. And then we went up and over the next pass. I can't remember what this pass was called. But at the top of the pass, there was two feet of snow um, that had just fallen that, in the snowstorm. The higher in the elevation, the more the snow, right? And for me, this was really the beginning of the end. Um, I had really hoped to finish the Sierras and at least finish the state of California. Uh, but I wasn't going to risk my life being up there by myself. So. Um, this was, this was the beginning of the end. I decided, okay, where am I going to stop hiking? At this point, my heart really wasn't in it. I was just, I was done. And uh, I decided uh, what better fitting place to end my hike than at uh, Yosemite National Park. Because um, I'd been sort of thinking a lot about John Muir. And John Muir, his, his, uh, his passion was Yosemite National Park. So I decided to end my hike there. And this is the trail going into the beginning of the Yosemite National Park until I got to Twomley Meadows. At Twomley Meadows, I sort of ended my park, he, uh, my hike. I looked up at that peak up there. You know what that peak is called? Unicorn Peak. Ah. Ah. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's fitting. Yeah. And then um, my last trail angels um, who picked me up. This couple here, uh, they hiked the PCT together 20 years ago. And they, since then they got married, 
uh, and they were on their 20 year wedding anniversary mm -hmm. going through and they saw me and they know they know what was happening and they picked me up and I'm like I'm ending my hike and they're like oh they gave me this big hug and they invited me to their campground where they made me steak and wine and I was like I think it was their anniversary dinner <laughs> 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 yeah so you know. but it was really sweet because I uh, it was hard I mean I, I didn't I didn't want to, I hadn't, I had not hiked the whole PCT. I, I did 1,812 miles, which is about two thirds. Um, but uh, it was, it was tough. So I ended my hike there, went home. Um, here's a picture of my before and after of, I didn't, ex I knew I was going to get like strong legs. I didn't expect to get strong arms, but I guess if you carry a heavy backpack every day, so. This is what the trail, I, I don't look like that now. But I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay, that's the end of my presentation. Um, this is a picture of me in Yosemite. I ended, after the PCT, I hiked Half Dome. And this is a picture of me on the top of Half Dome. Um, I have a blog if you want to read more about it. Um, I, ha I wrote a blog post every day. So... You can read more, and um, or not. <laughs> Maybe this is enough for you. I did talk for an hour and a half. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I also have um, my backpack here with all of my gear, and I'm happy to answer any gear questions or show you my gear. Yeah. How much did your backpack weigh? So my um, beef, without the consumables, my base weight was around 17 pounds. Um, which is kind of average, I think, for most through hikers. Um, you would see people who are clearly were doing like 25, 30 pound bags and you knew that they weren't gonna last long. Um, without a shake up, you would, you would go to some place and an experienced person would give you a pack shakedown. And they would like go through and they're like, why do you have 10 stuff sacks? Just throw it all into this garbage bag, done. Yes, this is what we do. Um, but I, that some people would go way more ultralight than me they were gone down to a base weight of like 10 to 12 pounds, but like I said, I like my I like my two. Uh, I'm not 20 years old. I can't just sleep on the ground. I need two back. I need two sleeping bags. Um, I I elected some people to hike without a stove and they just soak their food. Um, and I ended up soaking my food a lot because I'm lazy and I didn't want to take the time to cook. But it was nice to have a hot meal if I wanted. But the days that you had to have more water, how much did it weigh that day? Yeah, so base weight means right, right, no consumables. No consumables. If I, I mean, I think my, I, I don't know because I didn't have a scale. But I would, I, I, at the t when I went through the desert, I would carry these like bladders that would collapse when I didn't need them, um, and so I, I had a capacity of up to take of carrying up to seven or eight liters, and I did it once or twice, and that's like fifteen extra pounds. I think the heaviest my backpack got probably would be like forty five pounds. But I didn't do that very often. Yeah. Did you get bothered by mosquitoes at all? Um, a little bit. So I'm one of those people that mosquitoes don't like as much. That's what made my son quit. Um, he said, I hate mosquitoes. Yeah. Um, I would be hanging out with my friends at a campground, and the next morning they would have a hundred mosquito bites, and I would have two. So I'm just I'm not very delicious. So I guess. Um, they would bother me like they were in my face and they would buzz around me and would really bother me and I would I had a bug net um, one time more than once I had lunch where I got inside my tent I didn't even put up the poles and everything I just got in I zipped it up the bug net around me and I would hang out in there um, they really bothered some people but um, they bothered me a little bit occasionally but some people did really get bothered by bugs so it, it's a real problem and you, you I mean, do you want to bathe yourself in DEET? Some people do, but it's, yeah, it's a concern. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's <laughs> the magic. Um, the, there, there's another, it kind of, there's a, an edge that comes around this way and kind of comes around this way. And it's just made for taking pictures. So you would have your buddy go around to the other side. Okay. Now let me tell you, I was terrified in this picture. Like, you look straight down in the Yosemite Valley floors, like right down there. Um, you can see it. And uh, other people would go out to this like very ledge and they would be like, 
you know, jump up in the air, and I'm just like, <laughs> that's as close as I was good. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, it's. You started in April of 2017. When did you finish? Was it September? September, end of September. Yeah. But you know, I took a three weeks off in the middle. So, but yeah, I hiked five, six months. Do you? Okay, my friend, she's doing 60 miles for her 60th birthday in August from I 90 to I, the Highway 2. Yeah. You do that stretch, I can't remember if you said. No. That's because of fires, though. Yeah. Fires, okay. I'm going to do that stretch this summer. Okay. Yeah, I think it's might, it I think it's seventy eight miles. Or is she just gonna do sixty miles of it? Well she's yeah, she's gonna do seventy eight. She couldn't you know, she's yeah. gonna do sixty, but that I'm like, that's not sixty miles. No, yeah, she's gonna go a little farther. <laughs> sixty plus. Yeah, that that stretch is supposed to be one of the most beautiful stretches. And the great thing about it is like this the section of what the state of Washington is um, a lot more remote and more difficult to get to than the rest of the PCT. Yeah. So it's like if you want to except for where it crosses I ninety and, and Snoqualmie Pass and Stevens Pass where the freeways go over yeah. it then it's convenient, but otherwise you have a friend Stretch. with a truck who's getting you up these yeah. crazy forest service roads. Yeah, yeah. 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 so I'm going to do that this August. 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 July. Oh. Yeah. In the so back? I have to tell them okay. your yeah. blog. You can put that on your blog? Add that to your... Yeah, when I when I hike that okay. section, I will put I'll it on my blog. Okay. For sure. Yeah. yeah. In the back? Um, what were three or four of your favorite foods that you Foods. Um, well, I made all these foods ahead of time. I think the Fiesta rice and beans meal was kind of my favorite one that I made. The right, like dehydrated, um, like corn and red peppers, and I had dehydrated rice that I dehydrated, and I to, I took like refried beans mixed with salsa and then blended them up and put them in my um, future hydrator and, and it made bark and then I, I saw those yeah yeah so that that was a good one although about three or four months into it I kind of got tired of the meals that I made <laughs> and so I would get um, Annie's macaroni and cheese with little slices of I got spam single packets <laughs> and I would cut them up that was a pretty good um, I did I, a lot of people ate a lot of ramen um, I would just have ramen as a treat and so I would, I would make ramen, and then I would put in uh, the foil packets of tuna fish. And I would put that into the ramen, and I had dehydrated vegetables in advance, and I would add that into the ramen too, and that would make a pretty nice little meal. Um, I ate a lot of Cliff Bars. I tried not to, I tried to space them out so I wouldn't get too tired. But um, Bobo's oat bars, those are really good. Um, uh, I made my own trail mix, which I did get pretty tired of. <laughs> I bought all these like candy, um, dark chocolate bars from Trader Joe's that I mailed to myself. Those are pretty good. <laughs> um, I bought, uh, I also, I ate a lot of nut butter. So I ate a lot of, um, what's the brand? Justin's come in those like foil packets, which are small. And I, I had bought those in bulk in advance, although you can get those at most stores now. And then I bought a uh, little packets of jam in advance and those were in all my resupply boxes and then I would get a tortillas or bread and then I would make that's how I would make sandwiches for lunch every day for a while there I packed up cheese and so I would also do like spam and cheese sandwiches or tuna fish and cheese sandwiches or I'd make a quesadilla so those what are about jerky yep I ate a lot of jerky too yeah. lots of jerky cowboys did that you know yeah jerky is expensive <laughs> like Good jerky is really expensive, and, make, and I make you. I was discerning with my jerky. <laughs> I like with this cheap stuff. Yeah, it's good. It's good. One yeah. more question that kind of goes with it: How much do people typically spend on food? Would you think when you're doing this six month? Oh, <sighs> yeah, that's that's a good question. I didn't I didn't like track that. Like when 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 you do it the way that I did it, where you have to do everything up front. It, it's, it seems expensive, but then you don't have to pay for the resupplies along the way. But you need to plan for the fact that you're going to get really tired of the food that you brought. <laughs> it doesn't matter how awesome that you planned. You will get tired of it. Unless you're on a, a restricted diet where you can't eat other people's food or you can't eat gluten or you're a vegan or something, and that's a concern, and then some people have to pack their own foods. But, like, um, I halfway through I was putting half my food in the hiker boxes. I knew I was going to do that. I knew it would happen. I packed all my food. I dehydrated all my food anyway. So um, then you gave it away? I would. 
Okay. There's hiker boxes when you get to town okay. where you can put the stuff that you don't want and then you can get stuff out of there. Jeez. But I'm not really sure. That's cool. When people talk about how much money you should plan for in a hike, and I really recommend like a book like this. Um, this is a good book that talks about, um, does a better job than I'm doing right now of kind of explaining how you plan and budget for a long hike. Um, people would throw around, the, I mean, not just food, but for the whole hike, people talk about like you should budget five to $7,000 for the whole summer. That includes staying in hotels, that includes all the food you need to eat along the way. Think about how much it costs to just live every day here, right? Like you are camping in the middle of the woods, but you, you do need to think about the gear that you might lose and replace. One of my friends who was just in her 20s and out of college and didn't have any money, like, she had worked at REI and bought all of her shoes in advance. I went through, you go through a pair of shoes every 500 miles, or you should, because the, uh, the, the, the padding breaks down in your shoes. So, um, and she had bought her shoes in advance and had her sister mail them to her and the, the package got lost in the mail. And she had to wear that pair of shoes for another 400 miles uh, until the box got found. She couldn't afford to like buy a pair and she was miserable. So I do, uh, and, and a number of people get off the pill because they run out of money and they don't budget properly. And that's something to be considered of pr plan more than you think. But I don't, I don't have strong numbers on actual how much money I spent for a few minutes. I did a bad job of keeping receipts. I was too busy dehydrating. <laughs> um, any more questions? I think I think that people are uh, feeling like it's time to, to get up, and I think I'm done talking. So uh, if you're interested.